Welcome to another news of the week video and the first news we're going to talk about involved Commissioner Don Gabbard who recently provided a letter to fans updating this current situation that MLS find themselves in and I did read the letter and there's actually two key things that I did get out of the letter. One of them is that Gabbard did say that the ownership group around MLS is trying to create a good proposal to the, the MLS PA and also kind of trying to talk with the MLSP and continue a negotiation in terms of solving the big issue with the current CBA could potentially be terminated at the end of this 30-day period because of the forced margio clause being triggered a couple of weeks ago. Now, the other key thing that I did get out of the letter is that he did say that he still expect the upcoming MLS season to start on time and it's going to start in March. But again, that all depends on if both side of the MOSPA and the ownership group can agree on this current CBA before this 30-day period is over. And judging by the fact that there hasn't been a lot of news talk about how both sides have even came close to agree on this current CBA, something tells me we are once again seeing a situation where this is going to go down the wire and that this is going to be si similar to what happened last year where, remember last year, we were literally on the brinks of potentially going to a lockout because both sides couldn't agree on a new CBA and that they literally had to extend the old CBA deadline to a week so that they can continue to to negotiate before they finally got it done in the 11th hour and ever since then there's still some bad feelings that's been shared by both sides and hence maybe that's why it's taking longer than usual for both sides to kind of agree on this current CBA but Obviously, I'm really hoping that eventually they will agree on because, let's face it, I don't want to see the league go into another situation where they're on the brinks of potentially going to a lockout or they are going to be going to a lockout and the season is not going to start on time in a couple of months. Now, moving on, in terms of some of the transfer rumors, signings, and players leaving MLS, well, it's official. Jordan Morris has officially signed with Swansea City on a six-month loan deal with an option to buy. And as much as I know this is a disappointing thing for a Sounders fan to see happen and that this does create a little bit of an issue for the Sounders in terms of the winger position and it's something that they need to address in this offseason if they want to get back to themselves to the MLS Cup next season. I still think this is a win-win situation for both the Seattle Sounders and Jordan Morris. Uh, it's a win-win situation for Morris because, you know, this was really his last chance in terms of making the jump to Europe. He's going to turn 27 heading in to next season. So, you know, it's really kind of right around the age. It's now or never if you decided to to pl pl spend your, your time playing in Europe or you're just, just going to stay in MLS throughout the entire career. And knowing the fact that Morris know that, even though originally he says that he wants to stay in MLS for his entire career, he knows that if he's going to break into the national team or maybe even be a regular starter or regular player for the the national team, he needs to, of course, go to Europe. And that the this is a win-win situation for the Sounders because, you know, if Swansea does promote it to the Premier League next season, as Swansea is, as I mentioned, one of those teams that is chasing for promotion heading, heading into the end of the season. And Jordan Morris is a big part of Swansea potentially pr promote to the Premier League next season. Then I'm pretty sure the Sounders is going to get a huge sum of, of money if Swansea decided to buy him outright. And that sum of money can definitely be used to find a potential replacement for him. Or let's say if Swansea doesn't get promoted to the Premier League next season and if Jordan Morris didn't really have a good time in Europe, they can always recall him on the loan and, and that they can always get him back after the six-month period is over. And depending on if the season is going to start on time or not, that will be probably right about the end of July where they can, can potentially get Jordan Morris back to the Seattle Sounders. And by then, I still think that they'll still have enough time where if they are struggling and that they need to have kind of a Jordan Morris type of player to get them out of a bit of a hole that they find themselves in, they can, of course, recall him and that they can get themselves back to competitive level. So, yeah, again, it's a win-win situation for both both the player and the team, even though I know Sounders fans are a little bit disappointed that they're going to lose one of their best attacker who are heading into this upcoming season. Now, another player that is leaving MLS in these last couple of days is Luis Amaria, who recently officially left Minnesota so 
so that he could, of course, go back to South America and go to Ecuador to join LDU Quito. Now, this has been kind of kind of a dilemma that Minnesota's been dealing with for the past couple of months, where whether or not if the Loons were going to keep Luis Amaria heading into next next season and that a couple of weeks ago I did hear there was rumors saying that most likely Amaria is not going to be returning to the Loons next season and then last week I did hear there was also some rumors saying that it seems like Minnesota is still negotiating with Luis Amaria and there was kind of a glimmer of hope that maybe Amaria is going to be staying with this team well that glimmer of hope pretty much is no no more as it's, as I mentioned he officially agreed to leave Minnesota and go back to South America and it's such a shame the fact that Amaria wasn't able to stay with this team because I think that he's definitely going to to have a good recovery se season next year if he stay with Minnesota after he's been been dealing with a lot of injury and eventually had a season ending sur surgery to pretty much end his se season last year and that I always want to see what happened if Amaria and Reynoso play together and could that actually prevent Proved to be one of the best dynamic dual at attack in the league if that of course would happen but obviously that's not going to happen and now for Minnesota you know I know Adrian Heave yesterday says that they they are looking to try to sign four players including a new DP heading into the this offseason but unless if I actually hear legitimately rumors that players are going to be linked with this team or if players have officially signed their name on the, the paper to play for this team I am still nervous about Minnesota heading into this upcoming season and that I feel like if they don't do anything to 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 try try to replace some of the big big players that, that of course left this team like Kevin Molino and also Amaria something tells me we're not going back to the conference final next year and we're going to definitely take a step back if we're unable to address those issues. Now, moving on in terms of the next news is that the Houston Dynamo, who has been relatively busy in the last couple of weeks, have just recently acquired De Derek Jones from Nashville in exchange for 200000 general allocation money. Uh, not only the fact that I think this is a good move for, for the Dynamo, but I think this is a, a smart move for Derek Jones to decide to, to leave Nashville in order to join the Dynamo. Because I thought when Jones, during his time with Nashville, he was kind of more of a utility player and you know he only got got a fair amount uh, of appearance and, and has wasn't really a regular starter for this team and I know Jones is a guy that definitely have some good potential to be a decent player in this league and more of just being a utility player for an MLS team so I feel like him decided to leave leave to go to a team like the Dynamo who who is co coach under Tat Ramos and, and no knowing that Tat Ramos do believe in young guys and especially young American player to play play in his team. I'm pretty sure Jones is definitely going to get more time with the Dynamo compared to Nashville. And you know, in order for him to definitely fulfill his his good potential that he has, he's definitely need need more game time than compared to what he got last season with Nashville. And for Nashville, you know, yes, they did lose a decent utility player for them in their midfield, but still, their midfield is relatively stacked and they're they have a lot of depth in terms in terms of that and also they could have also used maybe some of their super draft pick this this year to try to potentially get another utility player like Derek Jones in into their midfield because you know after all they had tons of so draft pick thanks to paying 250,000 gam to to the union to acquire all their draft pick and this is basically pretty much them getting al almost all that money that they paid to the union back with them trading Derek Jones to the Houston Dynamo and that overall I think this is a good deal for for both of these teams and especially for for Derek Jones himself wanted to to get some more pl playing times and continue to to live up to his potential now LAFC have signed Jesus Morello on a permanent deal uh this is a no-brainer uh Morello when he came to LAFC you know, he definitely stabilized that defense a little bit and really kind of stopped this LAFC defense that just been absolutely terrible last year it was really really one of the big reasons why it kind of hold them back in terms of being an MLS Cup contender and probably even getting themselves eliminated early in the the playoffs and I can also say that he is probably he might be the best defender in that LAFC back line so again no big surprise that they decided to lock him on a permanent deal where before he was actually 
actually on loan and and that you know even though they they didn't maybe have to pay pay a certain amount of money to get him you know LAFC knowing what they have been doing this off season trying to sign a lot of defender and trying to improve their back line they hope that this will be a way that they can 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 potentially fix this issue and look competitive heading into this upcoming season. Now, Austin FC have recently signed Kakuta Mane off free agency. And I'll tell you what, Kakuta Mane is really trying to go go for Kai Kamara's record for the most team that that he that a player has played throughout his career in MLS. Because what? This is his fifth team that he has he have joined during his MLS career and his fourth team in the last five years. Like you talk about an ultimate major journeyman and probably you could ask me who is probably the ultimate journeyman in in this league besides Kai Kamara I would say it's got to be Kakuta Mane with the way that it seems like he's always bouncing around and switching team every, every sing, single time and keep in mind he's only 26 years old despite the fact that a lot of people feel like he, could, she, he should be a lot older than than 26 years old with the way that he feels like he's been in the league for a very long time but Either way, you know, this signing, eh, it's kind of a mass signing for Austin FC. I mean, I guess this might add some more depth in terms of their forward lines. Although, I still feel like they definitely need to to make some more signings in term, terms of the midfield. Because when I look at the, this midfield that Austin FC has, yeah, it isn't looking promising in, in terms of heading into their inaugural season. And, you know, midfield is probably the most import, important area of the field that you definitely need to have have a salt solid presence there because if you are a team and you you basically pl play play each game without a midfield then something tells me that's not going to go go very well well in most of the game so yeah that's something that i think austin fc is going to have to address even though i know they have signed a ton of players and now we're starting to kind of get a little bit bit of a, a shape of what this squad for austin fc is going to look like heading into their inaugural year but still again they need to improve they definitely need to sign more midfielder to to really improve that mid midfield that looks looks isn't looking very promising heading into their inaugural season now moving on in terms of talk about some of the transfer rumors that has happened in these last couple of days well rsl defender aaron herrera is once again drawing interest in Europe, and this time he's actually drawing interest in Serie A, and specifically Benevento was one of those teams that that is named to trying to get Aaron Herrera from RSL. And I won't be surprised if Herrera could be be the next American that could could make the jump to Europe or even go to Serie A because he's been linked with a lot of European team over the year, and that Herrera is also 23 years old right now, which is right around that age where a lot of these young American decided to to make the jump to Europe and knowing the fact that Herrera has already had some good experience in MLS I think you know there's really no this isn't one of those cases where maybe a young player might not have a lot of, lot of experience pl playing in MLS or in the professional game before he make that leap of faith to go to Europe oh uh, that's not the case with Herrera uh, he's already had a lot of experience and you know I know RSL was reluctant to try it to, to sell him because you know that he is one of their best defender on this team but at the end of the day you know if he is drawing a lot of interest and if the the price is right for for rsl to potentially sell herrera to europe i think it's going to to definitely happen now moving on in terms of the next news uh Atlanta united is rumored with argentino junior midfielder franco ibarra and remember how in the last news of the week episode i talked about how it was really strange seeing alana decided to link with a a south american player that is not not a young kind of player but instead of a player that is pretty much much in his twilight of his career well this rumor was kind of more more like it with alana and in some way this is a very atlanta type of rumor because you know that their bread and butter recruitment strategy is try to go down to South America and find these young hidden gems so that they can develop them into their team before potentially selling them off for a profit. Well, this is another guy that he is 19 years old and although he's only made 11 appearance with Argentino Jr., something tells me the Atlanta United scouting team feels like he could be a decent player that they can develop and eventually sell him for a profit in the later years so yeah i won't be surprised that this signing could potentially help and it also adds some more depth in terms 
of this Atlanta mid midfield depth, which is starting to to def definitely look much better compared to what what happened last season. Now, speaking of bread and butter recruitment strategy, uh, well, Atlanta bread and butter recruitment strategy has been going down to South America to look for these young hidden in gym to bring them up to develop them. Uh, the Red Bulls recruiting strategy or for the Red Bulls bread and butter recruiting strategy, it seemed like they are kind of looking at, at Europe and looking specifically at the lower division of English football to try and to recruit some of their players to come to the Red Bulls. And the latest player that is kind of part of that strategy is that they've been reported to sign Stoke City right back Tom Edwards on loan. Now, as much as, as I mentioned how this is kind of a bread and butter way with them them recruiting these lower lower league kind of player in English football to play for the Red Bulls, this is kind of a strange rumor and kind of a strange signing if they actually get this this done because unless if they decide to get get him and potentially push him, him as as a left back I don't see why do they need to sign another right back to this to their team when they're already kind of too deep in terms of that position I mean they already have Kyle Duncan and Egbo in terms of the depth chart of the, the right back position and usually in terms of that position and really in the fullback position not a lot of team is going to be going free deep in terms of that that road. So I feel like again, unless if they decided to to sign him and convert him to a to convert him as a left back, this signing just wouldn't make any sense whatsoever. And I'm pretty sure the Red Bulls still have more issue, especially on the attacking end, that they might might think about to focus instead of trying to to focus of bring another fullback into their team. Now Charlotte have recently says that they are now 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 no longer in pursuit of Andre Gallardo and actually said that they have no interest in signing Andres Gallardo that they've been linked with for the past couple of weeks and really for the past couple of months too. And Gallardo himself also said that all this rumor of him potentially leaving Spain and going to MLS and play for Charlotte is completely really false. And you know what? I think this is the right move for Charlotte that they decided that they, they announced that they are no longer going to be interested in Gallardo because as I mentioned before I think this move just does not make sense for Charlotte especially with the way that Gallardo if he does come to Charlotte in 2022 he'll be 35 years old and you do not want to have your star midfielder to be that old and potentially do some good things in MLS and as I said before many many times we are in an era of MLS where you just cannot bring in these aging European star player to come to the league and expect that they're going to be be an an instant impact and get yourself competitive and potentially get yourself to be an MLS Cup contender. So yeah, uh, I think Charlotte make the right decision that that they decided to cut ties in terms of this rumor. But now it's going to be interesting to see who else they're going to be linked with heading into their inaugural year. Like they haven't really signed a lot of player, if any players for their upcoming season. Even though I know it's still one and and a half year before their inaugural season start. But I think as time will go we will start to see some interesting names that's going to be linked with this team and and that and that it will be be interesting who is going to be the these player that's going to be linked with this expansion team that's going to be coming into the league heading into next season now peter vermees have recently give updates on the future of felipe gutierrez and gerso and by the way when i read the art article about this it seemed like they only gave updates on uh, on, on Gerso instead of Felipe Gutierrez because literally in the article it basically said well Gutierrez has pretty much been been injured throughout the entire year and that we still don't know if his future with SKC is resolved or not I mean that doesn't really tell me much in terms of 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 Peter he's actually giving an update of whether or not if he's staying with the 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 team heading into this upcoming season but as for Gerso you know the the article at least did give some good description in that you know, it seemed like most likely Gerso might not be back with this SKC team, uh, knowing the fact that he is going to be turn turning 30, and he's kind of more of a fringe utility player for for this team. And the fact that knowing SKC has already been pretty stacked in terms of the midfield position, Gerso is probably buried right down in the depth chart if he's going to come back to this team. So, yeah, most likely Gerso is probably not going to return to SKC, which means that I have a feeling he might get some good 
good offer if he does go to free agency. Again, you know, as much as he's kind of a fringe utility player, he can definitely at time be a very flashy player and he can definitely come off the bench to make an impact for y your team if you decide to, to si sign him. So yeah, we, we shall see whether or not if Jerso indeed is going to be le leaving SKC for free agency and then indeed there's going to be teams that's go going to try to 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 potentially offer him a, a contract and sign him off free agency. And then moving on in terms of the next news and kind of moving away from talk about transfer rumor signings and players leaving in these last couple of days is that the CONCACAF Champions League has officially announced their schedule for this year's competition and they decided to kind of take a page out of the UEFA Champions League this season in terms of this year's edition of CCL because unlike in the past where CCL seems to be kind of bunch up in terms of the knockout phase this year it's going to be spread out throughout the entire season of MLS where I know the quarterfinal and round of 16 is going to be taking place in April and May. But the semifinal is not going to be taking place until till August. Before the final is actually not going to be taking place in October. And by the way, the final is also going to be just a one-legged final. Just like last season. And the way that they determine who's going to host the final. Is pretty much going to be the team that has the best performance during the knockout phase. That will of course host the final. And I guess the way that that is to determine who will host the final might seems a little bit unfair and in some way this means that you really hope that you do not have a tough ro road to get into the CONCACAF Champions League final because you know let's say if you are a team that might got to the CCL final but you had to battle f through the your road to CCL because you have to play a lot of tough opponents and you might lose a couple of games throughout throughout those those matchup but then you of course will be facing a, an opposition that might have an easy road and pretty much a steam road their way into the CONCACAF Champions League final and they get to host the final even though they have a much easier time than what I just said with the other their CC, CCL, CCL finalists who had a tough road to get to it it just seems a little bit unfair and that I feel like in the future maybe CONCACAF might think about either just get rid of this for one leg it final or the fact that they'll just host it at a neutral, neutral venue and kind of do what what the UEFA Champions League does for their final usually hosting it at a new neutral venue but that being said you know in terms of this new new format I feel like this could be a benefit and disadvantage for MLS team the obvious benefit is that no longer MLS team is going to be kind of in preseason form against Liga MX or Central American team I mean that was really one of the biggest problem and pretty much the excuse of why MLS team has been really struggling in CCL in the past because these games are taking place in February and March and this is just during the time when teams are still in preseason or they're just starting in their first couple of games of the season compared to Liga MX team and Central American team that's already in the middle of their season but obviously the big disadvantage of this format is that this means there's going to be more fixture congestion for these MLS team that's going to be in CCL like I can't Im can imagine that there's going to be times where these MLS teams will have to go down to to Mexico or Central America to play an away game in one of the legs in, in the knockout phase. And then literally three days later, they have to go back to there and maybe play play an away game, game on the other side of the coast. Or maybe they go back to home on a free day rest to play at home. And that's going to be a really brut brutal kind of stretch for them. So... Yeah, I mean, the fixture con congestion, of course, is definitely going to be, be an issue. But, you know, overall, I think this is this is kind of a good format. And that maybe knowing the fact that CCLs did say that they're going to expand the competition. And they might bring back the groups, group stage phase that, that CCL kind of got rid of it a couple of years ago. It probably makes sense why they decided to kind of now just go through a format of a schedule where they're going to kind of spread out in the in, entire season instead of just kind of bunching up up like like what we've seen in the past now finally in terms of the last news i'm going to talk about isn't kind of related to mls but i kind of want to mention it because it was a big news in the sports world and that of course is nbc decided that they're going to be shutting down nbc sports network by the end of 2021 now nbc hasn't been broadcasting mls games since 2014 and that knowing the fact that we are about to head into a new broadcasting deal that's going to be happening in 2022. I was hoping maybe NBC might be making a comeback and they might 
might be be a network that might get get some rights in terms of broadcasting MLS games in the future. But knowing the fact that they decided to shut down one of their their main sports network and now decided to pretty much put all their other sports either on the USA network or on their new streaming device that is Peacock. Yeah, most likely I don't think think NBC is going to win the rights of hope of potentially broadcasting MLS game. And again, unless if they decide to, to put maybe most of the MLS game on their main network or put some on the USA network, I, I can't see how they're going to do what the Premier League, what they're doing with the Premier League coverage, which is put most of those games now on Peacock instead of being on the MB, on NBC or NBC SN. And I, you know, as a person that, that loves to watch the Premier League and, and, and been watching a couple of the these games for the past couple of years I definitely are very frustrating the fact fact that that NBC is try, trying to put most of these Premier League game on their other other streaming service that is Peacock and that by the way for those of you that don't know what what Peacock is it's basically kind of the ESPN plus version for for NBC and that you have to pay extra on top of of the cable or the core cutter that you of course have have paid and also this kind of is the reason why I don't think MLS is is going going to use NBC as one well, of their, their broadcaster because you know there's no way I would see 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 MLS decide to have have games that is going to be taking place in two different streaming service besides the main main provider like that would just makes absolutely no no sense whatsoever to put games not only on ESPN plus but now also put game on Peacock too but yeah I mean it's kind of su- such a shame that th- this is gonna gonna happen but you know I guess maybe we are now heading into an era where a lot of these main main kind of channel that that show sports like ESPN NBC uh, ABC and even Fox they are going to a stage where they're kind of a little bit m- money hungry or maybe they are kind of feeling the effects of COVID-19 where they are gonna be pushing these new stream service and going to have to ask people to pay pay even more on top of what already is a lot of money that a lot of people have to pay for cable and cord cutters but either way hope you guys enjoyed this video if you do make sure you guys leave a like smash that subscribe button let me know in the comments below what do you think of this episode of news of the week and as always if there's any news i didn't mention on the board let me know in the comments below but until then hope you guys enjoyed this video and i will see you guys next time